Hello. In this video, we are going to derive a solution to the particle in a box problem. In this example, we're going to look at the one-dimensional box. By convention, uh, we go along the x-axis and the length of the box is L, so we can think of it as a coordinate system going from 0 to L, and this is the area that's inside the box. Anything to the left of 0 or anything to the right of L is outside the box. Now we imagine that we're able to keep the particle in the box. It's completely free inside the box, so there's no potential between 0 and L, but to the left of 0 and greater than L, the potential is infinitely high. So you can imagine that inside the box, our particle is described by some, some wave function. Now this wave function has interesting properties. One of the important properties it has is we know that at exactly at, at the endpoints that the wave function has to equal zero. So we can kind of write this. We know in this region that psi is going to be exactly equal to zero and that to the left here, the psi is also equal to zero. How do we know that psi is equal to zero? Well, recall that we can describe the probability of finding a particle in a particular region by the probability density psi squared. So if psi squared is equal to zero, meaning that there's no possibility at all that the particle is there, then we know by implication that psi has to equal zero itself. And we have exactly the same situation that occurs for um, x less than zero. Now, how do we know that psi is exactly zero at the endpoints themselves? So at this point here, at x equals zero, and at x equals l, we also know that the wave function has to be exactly zero. The reason we're able to say this is that our wave function psi has to be continuous. Not only does it have to be continuous, the first and second derivatives also have to exist. So since the wave function has to be continuous, and we know that just outside of the box, the wave function has to equal zero, then we know that the wave function has to equal zero exactly at the end points. So the problem we want to solve, we want to solve the Schroeder equation in the case of no potential inside the box. So we recall that that would give us minus h bar squared divided by 2m times the second derivative of psi is going to be equal to e times psi. So we want to come up with a trial wave function that will satisfy this particular equation. The trial wave function that we want to try is of the following form. We have c times sine of kx plus d times the cosine of kx. We have shown in a previous video that we could write the free particle wave function as an exponential e to the i kx or e to the minus i kx. And we also showed that we could transform a wave function in that form into a wave function of this trigonometric form. And we'll see for our derivation that this particular form of the wave function makes life easier for us. So how are we going to proceed? The first thing we want to recall is that we know that the wave function has to equal zero exactly at x equals zero. So I'm going to look at the wave function when x is equal to zero. So we simply substitute zero into our equations wherever we have x. So what does that give us? We have c times the sine of kx. So that means that's going to be the sine of zero plus d times the cosine of zero. And we know that this entire wave function has to be zero at that point. So the value of the wave function is going to be zero as well. 
Well, what does this tell us? <clears throat> we already know that the sine of zero is zero. So this term to the left-hand side drops out immediately, because that's going to equal zero. So we're left with the condition that d times the cosine of zero equals zero. But the cosine of zero is simply one. So this tells us immediately that the constant d has to be equal to zero in our trial wave function. Now, since we've already determined that d has to equal zero, this tells us that our wave function can be simplified slightly to the form c times the sine of kx. So we've first used our boundary condition at x equals zero to determine that the constant d is equal to zero. So let's see what happens when we proceed at the other boundary condition. So now let's look at the case where x equals l. So we want to look at the wave function at the point x is equal to l. So we're going to substitute l for x into our equation. So this tells us that the wave function is going to be c times the sine of k times l. And recall that the wave function has to be exactly zero at this point so we set this equal to zero. Now recalling the nature of the sine function, recall that the sine function is periodic and the sine is equal, uh, sine of x for example, is equal to zero when x is equal to zero, pi, two pi, three pi, example. So that tells us that this is gonna be equal to zero whenever kl k times L is equal to N times pi, where N is a whole number. This would also work if N is a negative whole number, but we would get identical solutions. So if this is our condition, that this wave function will equal zero, whenever kl is equal to n times pi, we can actually solve for k. We divide both sides by l, we can see that k is going to be n times pi over l, and we've already written down the conditions on l. What does that give us for our wave function? Well, it tells us, having applied our boundary condition, that the newest form of our wave function is going to be c times the sine and we want to replace this k into our wave function kx, so we have n pi x over l, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, and some whole number. So that's what we've gotten by first applying the boundary condition at x equals 0, and then applying the boundary condition at x equals l. We still have one remaining complication with the general form of our wave function solution. And it involves a situation when n is equal to zero. So note that if n is equal to zero, then n pi x over l is also equal to zero. Sine of zero is zero and the wave function will be zero. But it will be zero, so it tells us that the wave function will be zero. The important thing here is for all x. And it's for all x inside the box. Okay, so if the wave function inside the box is equal to zero everywhere, that also tells us the following thing. It tells us that psi squared is equal to zero for all x. Psi squared is our probability density. So this tells us that if n is equal to zero, the probability of the particle being anywhere inside the box is zero. But we know that we have a particle in the box and that's a contradiction. So this contradicts the fact that we actually know we have a particle inside the box. So 
So we have a contradiction. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we solve the problem simply by eliminating the possibility that n is equal to zero. So we have to remove the case that n is equal to zero. That would lead to a contradiction that we don't actually have a particle in the box. But the rest of these will work because while it'll make the wave function equal to zero at some places, in particular at the endpoints, and perhaps some points elsewhere, it won't lead to the wave function being zero everywhere. And that's the kind of key point is that if n is equal to zero, it makes the wave function zero everywhere inside the box. So this gives us the general form of our wave function solution to the particle in the box. For our next step, we want to determine the value of C such that this is a normalized eigenfunction. So recall by definition of normalization, psi star psi d tau would be equal to one. So for this particular example, that would tell us that we have the integral from zero to L of C squared sine squared of n pi x over L dx. And we can factor out a c squared in front. So we have a c squared times this integral from 0 to L of sine squared n pi x over L dx. Now since this wave function is real, we can replace psi star psi, what we simply did here was replace it by psi squared. Because for a real function, the complex conjugate is exactly equal to the wave function itself. If we consult a table of integrals, we notice that the definite integral of sine squared of ax dx can be solved as x over 2 minus sine 2ax over 4a. So for our particular example, we're going to make the substitution that a is equal to n pi over l. So <clears throat> to solve the integral from 0 to L of sine n pi x over L dx. And this, remember, this is multiplied by c squared, and we're setting it all equal to 1. is going to be equal to x over 2 minus, here's where the a substitution comes into it, sine of 2n pi x over L, all divided by 4a, so that's 4n pi over L, and between the limits of integration are going to be between 0 and L. Now this looks like a mess, but one thing which helps us a great deal is the following. Let's just look at this rightmost term. When x is equal to 0, we have the sine of 0 in the numerator, and we know that the sine of 0 is 0. So that tells us that this limit of integration, this rightmost term drops out. Similarly, at the other limit of integration, when x is equal to L, L over L cancels as 1. So we have the sine of 2n pi. And since we're restricting the values of n to be 1, 2, 3, again, sine is going to be equal to 0. So at both of the limits of integration, this term drops out completely. So that's fortunate for us. So, what do we have? Well, we get that 1 is equal to c squared, that's still in front. Our limits of integration, when x is equal to l, we have l over 2. At the other limit of integration, when x is equal to 0, we have simply 0. 
So this tells us that 1 is equal to c squared times L over 2. What we want to do is solve for c squared. So first we multiply each side by 2 over L to get that 2 over L is equal to c squared. And then our last step in normalizing this eigenfunction is to take the square root of each side and we determine that c is equal to the square root of 2 over L. So, in summary, what does that give us as our normalized eigenfunction for the particle in the box? Well, it tells us that psi is going to be equal to the square root of 2 over L times the sine of n pi x over L, where n can take the values 1, 2, 3, and so on. It has to be a positive integer. Not only that, we notice that um, are not only these solutions to the Hamiltonian, these also are normalized eigenfunctions. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.